This is the Youth Bible with Nikki and Pippa Gumbel, day 83. What do you think it's like to walk on the moon? My guess is that it feels quite light. You feel quite bouncy. Uh, you'd feel amazed and probably stunned, maybe a little bit scared as well. But mainly, you'd probably be in amazement seeing Earth all that way away. But today, we're looking at how God wants to amaze you on this Earth uh, through his choices, through Jesus' ministry, and also through the wonder of his forgiveness. The eagle has landed, said Neil Armstrong. President Nixon, watching the events on television, described it as one of the greatest moments of our time. The Pope greeted the news by exclaiming, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth to men of goodwill. At 3.56 a.m. on the 20th of July, 1969, Neil Armstrong stepped off the ladder from the eagle and onto the moon's surface. That's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, he said, as he became the first man to walk on the moon. Due to the recent invention of television, this remarkable event was the first of such historic significance to be seen so widely and known so immediately. The whole world watched with awe and amazement. James Irwin, another astronaut who walked on the moon, said, Jesus walking on the earth is more important than man walking on the moon. When people saw what Jesus did, their response was awe and amazement. Everyone was amazed. They were filled with awe. From Psalm 37 But the meek will inherit the land, and enjoy peace and prosperity. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked. For the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The blameless spend their days under the Lord's care, and their inheritance will endure forever. Stand in awe and amazement at the choice of God. Do you ever stand in awe and amazement at the sort of people God chooses? Whereas the world tends to be impressed by people of wealth and power. It's not so with God. God chose the foolish, the weak, the lowly, the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. God chooses first the unassuming, The meek will inherit the land and enjoy peace. Meek does not mean weak, spineless or feeble. It's the word used of Moses. Jesus described himself as meek. It means gentle, considerate and unassuming. It's the opposite of being arrogant and self-seeking. It's the word used of a horse that's been broken, that is tamed. It means strength under control. Jesus seems to be quoting this verse when he said, Blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. Second, the poor and needy. God is concerned for the poor and the needy. Those who treat them badly are wicked in God's eyes. Better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked, for the power of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Third, the persecuted. The theme of these verses in Psalm 37 is that the wicked plot against the righteous, as the psalmist contrasts the righteous and the wicked. It is not that they are merely two separate categories of people, but one is proactive in its hostility to the other. Bad guys have it in for the good guys. These verses remind us that it's not for us to retaliate if we are persecuted, because God has it all under control and he will ensure that justice is done in the end. We do not need to take revenge into our own hands. Lord, I stand in awe and amazement at the people you choose. Help me to see people as you see them, not by the world's standards, but with your eyes. New Testament from Luke 5 One day Jesus was teaching, and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him in on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friends, your sins are forgiven. 
the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home, praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, We have seen remarkable things today. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting in his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Look with awe and amazement at the ministry of Jesus. Have you wondered how people must have felt when they saw Jesus perform a miracle? His ministry led to amazement and awe. Everyone was amazed. They were filled with awe. The Amplified Version captures this sense of excitement. An overwhelming astonishment and ecstasy seized them all. And they recognized and praised and thanked God. And they were filled with and controlled by reverential fear and kept saying, we've seen wonderful and strange and incredible and unthinkable things today. First, healing the sick. Even in the ministry of Jesus, there seemed to be ebbs and flows in terms of healing. Sometimes, when there was unbelief, Jesus healed fewer people. At other times, as we read here, the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal those who were ill. Second, forgiving sins. We tend to find healings amazing, but we take the forgiveness of sins rather for granted. Jesus demonstrates here that forgiveness is even more amazing and awesome than healing. He first forgives the man's sin and then shows that he has the authority to do so by healing him. Forgiveness was the priority. Third, reading people. Jesus read their minds. He knew what they were thinking in their hearts. To forgive those who've sinned against others is something only God can do. When Jesus claimed the authority to forgive the sins of those who had sinned against others, in their hearts they accused him of blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? In a sense, they were right. Jesus was claiming the authority of God to forgive sins. No wonder the people rubbed their eyes incredulous and then also gave glory to God. Awestruck, they said, We've never seen anything like that. Fourth, choosing outcasts. Jesus' choice of Levi, the tax collector, as his followers was amazing. He chose an outcast, but he made the right choice. Levi got up, left everything and followed him. He then gave a great banquet for Jesus at his house and a large crowd came. Levi was clearly an influential leader. People were fascinated by what had happened to him and wanted to meet Jesus. Jesus' choice was shocking and startling. Whenever I go into prisons, I see that Jesus is still calling as his followers people who are rejected by society, and I'm filled with awe and amazement. Fifth, befriending sinners. Once again, Jesus amazed people. They asked, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the heart of the good news for all of us. Joyce Meyer writes about this passage. So often we feel we must hide our weaknesses and always pretend we're strong and in need of nothing. But we all have weaknesses and inabilities. Jesus came for those who were sick, needy, not for those who were healthy, not needy. Go ahead and be needy. Tell God everything you need. He already knows anyway and is waiting for you to ask for help. Lord, thank you that you are the same yesterday, today and forever. I ask that your power would be present to heal the sick. May people be struck with awe and amazement as they see you continuing to do remarkable things.
Old Testament from Numbers 16 to 18. Then Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put incense in it, along with burning coals from the altar, and hurry to the assembly to make atonement for them. Wrath has come out from the Lord. The plague has started. So Aaron did as Moses said and ran into the midst of the assembly. The plague had already started among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made atonement for them. He stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. Meditate in awe and amazement at the wonder of forgiveness. We have a tendency to take forgiveness for granted. The poet Heinrich Hein once said, Dieu me pardonnerai, c'est son métier. God will forgive me, it's his job. In one sense, nothing could be further from the truth. Sin has a very high cost. Many of the things we read about in the Old Testament strike us as awful in the sense that they seem to be appalling. However, another sense of the word awful is filled with awe. One dictionary definition of awful is worthy of or commanding profound respect or reverential fear or wonder, solemnly impressive, sublimely majestic, The language in this passage shows the seriousness of sin, its cost and the reaction of God to it. Wrath has come out from the Lord. God is not pleased at, for example, constant grumbling. Sin required atonement. There was a need for redemption. Sprinkling of blood was required. The setting up of the Levitical priesthood was necessary to foreshadow and prepare the way for Jesus, the great high priest, whose blood was sprinkled and who made atonement to redeem us from our sins. Unless you understand the seriousness of sin and the Old Testament background, which shows the difficulty and complication of receiving forgiveness, you will not understand how wonderful, awesome and amazing God's forgiveness is. Forgiveness is not automatic, but it is made possible by Jesus. As you meditate on what God has done for you, you should be filled with wonder, awe and amazement. Lord, thank you that through Jesus' death and resurrection, I can know that I am forgiven. Thank you that I live in the age of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for how the events of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit have transformed my life and transformed this world. May the eyes of the whole world be open to see these remarkable events with awe and amazement. Pepper adds, As we see in Luke 5, Verse 17. It's not always easy to bring our friends to Jesus. It takes perseverance. It takes persistence. Well, obviously, prayer and even thinking outside the box. Or in this case, dismantling a roof. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you give me good things. Thank you that you give me forgiveness. Fill me today with joy so I can overflow to other people the awe and amazement I am in of you. In Jesus' name, Amen.